Director of Faculty Christian Forum, and also on behalf of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, this is a, a, joint, um, a joint venture. And the CSDA, I have some brochures describing the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation. We are associated with a group in the States called the, the ASA, and together we produce a peer reviewed journal called Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith. We're having a um, Canada-wide conference in May, and um, there's some exciting speakers that are going to be out in Surrey and Langley, but uh, some of our exciting speakers include Santa Ono and um, Dennis Danielson from UBC, and also Catherine Tejo, who is an acclaimed uh, climate scientist. So these are just three of the speakers that we'll be having. You can pick up some information about that. There's some little bookmarks that have the information about that over there and some um, general brochures about the CSCA. Okay, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce Bill Newsom. Uh, I first met Bill in 2001, and uh, it's been a long time. Um, Bill has been at Stanford for 30 years, more than 30 years. He's the Provostio Professor and Director of the Stanford Neurosciences Institute, and he's also an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Previously, he was at St. John's College in Oxford and at Stony Brook. Um, his degrees come from Stetson University in Florida and Caltech. He holds many, many awards, but I thought the most interesting one was the Carl Lashley Award given by the American Philosophical Society. So this is not just our science. And he's produced over 100 publications. So without any further ado, would you join me in welcoming Bill Newsom? So thank you. Thank you very much. Or is this on? Everyone can hear me? Okay, great. <clears throat> thank you very much, Judy, and thanks to all of you for being here on a uh, Wednesday afternoon. And I'm sorry for the little bit of breathlessness here. I've been having some problems with my vision the last couple of days, and I got in to see an uh, ophthalmologist on an emergency basis half an hour ago, and everything's great. So um, I'm glad to be here now. I just have to focus. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk today about this boundary between uh, science in general, and then I'll focus down on neuroscience and uh, faith, religious faith. And, uh, you know, a lot of what I'm going to have to say, some of it is Christianity-specific, some of it is not Christianity-specific, and I think will be of interest to other faith traditions and uh, people who are intellectually interested in this material uh, in and of itself. Um, but I, I w will focus on some of the issues I, around the sort of subject of free will when I get to the neuroscience part of it. I have done a lot of work in decision making over the last 20 years and neural mechanisms of decision making, some of you may know. Uh, and I get asked this question a lot, you know, about if there are mechanisms that underlie our decisions and uh, brains are really capable of producing these things according to very, uh, you know, machine-like principles, then what kind of room does that leave to think about free will and moral responsibility and things like that? So I'll get toward that stuff at the end of the talk. The talk's going to come in three parts. Uh, first, I'm going to talk generally about science and uh, scientific results because sometimes there's a perception that the findings of science render religious perspectives or religious understanding or faith experience superfluous and we all ought to be doing science and forget this religion stuff. And I want to just make a point that, and I won't, I won't dwell on it a lot, but a point that there's no necessary tension, in my opinion, between religious faith and any discoveries of science, any actual findings of science. Uh, and I will have a little bit to say about that. But then I will have a second point in the second part of the talk that will be a little bit, I'll spend a little more time here. Tension can occur. This is one place where I think uh, tension can occur and does occur sometimes legitimately between religion and sort of the working everyday assumptions of science and how we do science in laboratories, but especially when those assumptions are elevated to the status of a sort of all-encompassing ideology. And that ideological move is extra scientific. And some people make it for their own reasons, and that's fine. People make Make ideological moves for all kinds of reasons. Just want to recognize that that's not science per se. It's not a necessary result of science. 
And then um, the last part of the talk, I'll get down to talking about the brain a bit, and I'll talk about this sort of general topic of neuroscience, causality, and free will. So that's your roadmap. That's the outline of where I'm going to go here over the next 45 minutes, and I hope uh, some of you enjoy the ride or provoked by the ride, and you'll have an opportunity to um, tell me the error of my ways at the, at the end. Okay, so um, let's talk about, first of all, about the findings. Some of the findings of science that, uh, you know, that science tells us a lot about origins, about the origin of the universe, about the origins of life on Earth. Um, but I find that some of these stories are remarkably uh, consonant. The scientific stories are remarkably consonant with a lot of the deepest, I think, religious understandings. And in particular, you know, the finding of the Big Bang is very resonant with uh, much of the creation stories in the traditional uh, uh, Genesis literature in, in Christianity and Judaism. And the reason I say that is because uh, before the Big Bang, there was a major entertainable theory that the universe has always existed. It's all there is, it's all there ever will be, and it, its history goes back infinitely in time. But we know now that that's not true. Our best cosmological and physical ideas uh, indicate to us that there was a moment of creation, an actual moment of creation for about 14 billion years ago. And before that moment in time, space and time itself didn't exist and our universe came into, came into being. And you know, to me that sounds a lot like a moment of creation and something that could have uh, significance uh, for all of the beings that subsequently come forth from that moment of creation. Uh, Robert Jastrow is uh, an astronomer. He's former head of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in NASA, and he wrote this little book kind of reflecting on this development, you know, after these developments in cosmology and physics uh, surrounding the Big Bang. He called it God and the Astronomers. It's a little book. It's a fun read. It's only about 90 pages long. And he's not a believer, as far as I know, but he could sort of summarize this, you know, this uh, intellectual conquest of you know, origins of our universe, and he summed it up like this. He said, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, this story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak, and as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. Um, so, you know, it's consonance, it's resonance. Uh, I, I, one uh, finding another origin uh, finding and story that's been a source of conflict between science and religion, especially in the United States, not very much in the past 50 years in the Catholic tradition, but very much in the evangelical tradition, is the theory of evolution by natural selection. This is sometimes seen as being fundamentally antithetical with, with the religious understanding of a purposeful creation of the world by, by a loving God. And uh, one of the things that really bugs people about evolution is its dependence on randomness. The idea that there are random mutations, and these random mutations, their effects get selected for. Uh, and how can anything that depends on random mutations be purposeful in any meaningful sense of the word? And to me, this argument has always seemed very strange, because I use random events for purposeful ends in my laboratory every day. Um, it's really important for us to be able to generate random numbers and use them intelligently. And that's not just true in the kind of work that I do. It's true in things like uh, you know, genetic programming uh, in all kinds of fields. This is why people who write good random number generating software are so valued and why so many of us use their products is because we use them for purposeful ends. So that, I think, is not a point of tension. It's a little bit specious, I actually think. Here's where I think the point of tension more lies, and it's sort of how you interpret the evolutionary process. And one interpretation has been put forward and argued very eloquently by Stephen Jay Gould, who really emphasizes, when he's talking about evolution, he emphasizes contingency in evolution. The fact that these historical accidents that we call mutations get baked into evolution, and the whole, um, the whole uh, history of evolution and the whole range of possibilities gets changed forever by random events that happen at certain points in time. And he calls this contingency. So the whole future development of evolution is contingent upon things that happen at particular points in time. And he invites us to do the thought experiment of rewinding the tape and going back to the Big Bang and having the whole thing replay again. And would we come up with life forms in the universe or on this planet? Or would we even come up with this planet? Would we, but would we come up with life forms that are, bear any resemblance to the life forms that are here today? And he says no. 
because of the contingency, you do this 100,000 times, you're going to get 100,000 different answers. And that's, if you believe that, that's hard to reconcile with any kind of purpose in creation. But I think equally, if not more compelling, is the view of Simon Conway Morris, who's a very prominent uh, evolutionary paleontologist at Cambridge University, has written several books that you can go out and read. I, I recommend them. And, and Conway Morris actually emphasizes convergence in evolution so that there are certain solutions to the problems posed by life that are optimal or near optimal. And if you gave evolution 100,000 chances to find those, those solutions, it's going to come to the same solutions. It may come by different paths, but it's going to come to the same solutions. So that there are optimal ways to actually locomote through water, and evolution is going to find them every time. There are optimal ways to sense light and respond to light and garner energy through light, and evolution is going to find them. And he cites many, many examples of convergent evolution. So, for example, in evolutionary history, the eye, the compound eye, like ours, has been invented about 25 separate times. You know, it doesn't come from one invention, then everybody subsequently inherits it. it. In different species lines, it's actually been invented by evolution about 25 different times. So you have these different evolutionary trees converging on particular optimal solutions. So if you take this seriously, then you could imagine replaying that tape in Gould's ex thought experiment 100,000 times and coming to roughly similar conclusions. Now, this might sound like wishful thinking of some, you know, religiously motivated person whose brain is twisted by the idea of trying to find purpose in the universe. But here's a real irony. I claim as my ally in this point of view none other than Richard Dawkins, who certainly is no friend of religion, right? Um, so this book is actually an excellent book about evolution, The Blind Watchmaker, which I enjoyed reading. But I was startled when I got to somewhere around page 150 in this book, and I read the following quote. And he's trying to make, it, make us see how evolution can be natural and easy. And it's, and, and it's not that difficult to uh, create complex objects and processes through regular evolution-like mechanisms. And Dawkins says in this place, uh, my personal feeling is that once cumulative selection has gotten itself properly started, we need to postulate only a relatively small amount of luck in the subsequent evolution of life and intelligence. And now the blue is my emphasis, but it's a direct quote. Cumulative selection, once it has begun, seems to me powerful enough to make the evolution of intelligence probable, if not inevitable. That inevitable, that's a really strong word. And if the evolution of intelligence is an inevitable, and of socially responsive beings, of beings that are uh, capable of responding um, in love, if that's inevitable, that sounds a lot like creation and purpose in creation, that this solution had to happen. So there it is, you know, from Dawkins, who's not, not a religiously motivated person. So I don't think, you know, that uh, we should get, um, you know, that, that I don't think people of religious sentiment and faith sentiment uh, should worry a ton about the theory of evolution. I do not think that it presents any deep conflict as long as you're willing to read the first chapter of Genesis in a somewhat allegorical fashion, as St. Augustine of Hippo definitely did. Uh, so, so I don't think that that's terribly uh, problematic. I, I could cite others here, and many of you know this literature better than I do, but there are there's a whole body of study about something called the anthropic principle uh, that points out that there are at least a dozen fundamental constants in the universal, like the universal gravitational constant and a number of others about chemical bonds, that um, if they had been different by one in ten decimal places or something like that, then the character of our physical world would change in such a way that biological life as we know it would have been impossible to develop in this universe. And it just simply says that our universe, from the physics that we know, seems improbably hospitable to life. Could just be a coincidence. It doesn't prove anything. But again, it sort of resonates with certain truths in, in religious faith traditions. So that's basically what I want to say about the findings of science. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very quick tour. We could you know, spend a lot more time on any one of those things. And to me, again, I would say that, that there's no deep conflict between the findings of science and properly interpreted and properly interpreted religious faith. 
Here's where the uh, tension can arise, however, and frequently does arise in many encounters that I have with you know, people who find out, you know, who know me as a scientist, they find out I'm a religious person, and I had one person just say, how can a scientist like you believe all that stuff? Or you know, on a postdoc in my lab, talking with him over lunch one day, said, you know, we were talking about these fate things, he says, but Bill, this is so different from your normal way of thinking, you know? <laughs> and, uh, of course, what he thought is my normal way of thinking is my scientific self, where I am very argumentative. I am very, um, I have high standards for what I uh, believe to be true, sort of admit to the canon of what I believe to be true about the universe from a scientific point of view. Uh, I'm critical. I expect my colleagues to be critical of my work. It's one of the best things that we do for each other as scientists, hold each other to high standards. And he says, you know, this religious stuff is just so different from your normal way of thinking. How, how does that work, right? And I've had a lot of conversations like that over the years. Um, so this is, this is a problem when you get down to the core of it. You get down to the nub of it, I think. It's really about assumptions. And there are differences between scientific experience and endeavor and religious experience and endeavor. No doubt about that. So science is experiment-based. It's, it achieves, it aspires to be very precise, and most importantly, it aspires to be objective. So we aspire to establish m knowledge that can be transferred anywhere in the world, you know, to Asia, to Africa, any place someone's got the right equipment, the right education, the right sort of uh, uh, conceptual background, they can reproduce the data that are reproduced in my lab. We can reason about them, we can have different inferences about what they mean theoretically. We can design new experiments to try to resolve some of those differences. But fundamentally, it's knowledge that can be shared from community to community to community to community. On the contrast, religion is more holistic. It's, there's more involved at a complete interpretation of life. It's, it has a greater dependence on intuition, and it requires commitment in the absence of proof in a scientific sense of the word. Um, now, these are not black and white differences. I would say that science is holistic to some extent. Um, science depends on intuition. You know, where Albert Einstein got some of his intuitions from, you know, us mere mortals will, will probably never know. Uh, also, science requires a lot of commitment. I think someone, of someone like Stan Prusiner at UCSF, who was, won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of prions, which are proteins that are infectious agents in certain kinds of disease. And he was ridiculed for this for a decade. You know, we knew that bacteria and viruses, other living organisms, were responsible for infectious disease. And this was a nutcase postulating that proteins could act as uh, virulent communicators of disease. And ultimately, he was proven right and won a Nobel Prize. And of course, his 10 or 15 years struggling in the wilderness pale in comparison to Copernicus, right? Who struggled his whole lifetime. So scientists are committed, and, and, and they do make some kinds of faith commitments. Nevertheless, there's a difference in these communities. I will not be the person to argue that they're the same because they're not the same. So religion is just more holistic, and it requires commitment in the absence of a proof. And like my postdoc I told you about, uh, he'll say, you know, why go there? Why not just stick with science? This is so different from the way you normally think, Bill. And why even go there? Why not just stick with science, which is more reliable? And this is the, this is the, this, the assumption, okay? This is the key assumption here. And it's extra scientific. It's, a, it's really, a, you know, it's a, it's a, I don't know, it's a belief move, an ideological move. And the extra scientific assumption is that science is the only path to reliable knowledge about the world, okay? Now, that may or may not be true, but let's all realize that that is not a result of science itself. That's a general assumption that people might make. And I think it's wrong, okay? And what I would argue is that this religious mode of thought that is holistic, depends on intuition, requires some faith in the absence of proof, I would argue that that religious mode of thought and belief is a normal and necessary mode of evaluation and decision-making in real life for all of us. For my postdoc, for me, for everyone in this room, for everyone out there on that busy mall uh, in the gathering dusk, um, it is a necessary part of our lives. Um, the scientific mode, in contrast, what we do in laboratories, practicing the scientific method, it's quite peculiar. 
I think it's applicable to a rather narrow range of human experience, and it is generally practiced by a rather small community of highly trained professionals. And the corollary to this that I would say is that the most important questions in our lives are not susceptible to solution by the scientific method. None of us can run around living our lives by the scientific method. It just doesn't work. So what's an example? What am I talking about up here? Well, here's an example of a question that I think is not susceptible to solution by the scientific method. Is it better to live or to die? And for some people in this room, this may have been a real question at some point in your lives. And for almost everyone in this room, this, this will have been a real question for someone you love or someone you know. And I think we'd all agree that that's an important question. But there's no set of experiments you can run off to a laboratory and do that will give you an answer to this question. It just is not that kind of question. And our lives abound with questions like this. It's not just extreme things like this. Here's a really common one. Should I marry this person? Okay? Now, if you wait for scientific compelling proof that you should or should not marry a particular person, you'll be waiting a very long time. Okay? It just, this is another question that just doesn't work like that. There's not a set of experiments you can go into a laboratory and do. It's not even really a set of thought experiments you can do. Some of the stuff just has to be lived. And, you know, the fundamental fact is we can't do control experiments. Science works best when you get a particular phenomenon that you're studying and you replay that phenomenon over and over again while you manipulate this variable and this variable and you see how it ends under this scenario and that scenario and you really get to know it intimately. But you can't do that in our most important decisions in life. You know, another one being, should I move? Should I take another job on the opposite coast and pull my family out of their web of relationships and, and, uh, and, and start a new life, essentially, with all of us in another place? And that's another one, you know, that you got one shot. We get one shot at our most important choices. So I think that the religious quest involves the same sort of reasoning as the marriage example. Uh, importantly, it doesn't mean we check our brains at the door. So this is a, a caricature or a canard that, you know, many of my scientist friends sort of raise. You know, why would you believe something that's in a musty old book rather than something that you live and experience? You know, just this, these lists of arbitrary rules. Um, isn't that a little bit brain dead? But I don't think it means that we check our brains at the door. We don't check our brains at the door when we decide to get married, hopefully. Some of us do, apparently, but um, hopefully you don't have to, right? That's not a choice that you have to make. Uh, you, there's all kinds of reasoning you do. You, you have the, the evidence of yourself and an experience of relationship with the other person. You know the other person's family and some kind of the culture they're born in, and you can make certain inferences from that. You ask older mentors uh, for advice and what they know about you, what they observe about you. Uh, you reason on the basis of common goals and shared characteristics. You, you use your brain as much as possible, but in the end, you know, it only gets you part of the way. And if you're going to marry or you're going to commit, you have to step out on faith at some point and make a commitment and live that thing out. And I think that's exactly describing an authentic religious quest. Uh, I think it involves that same sort of experience and that same sort of reasoning. But even reason as hard as you can, at the end of the day, uh, the evidence is not compelling in the scientific sense. Uh, faith accompanied by commitment is essential. And the stakes are high. These are consequential decisions. These are not trivial decisions. They're, they're very consequential decisions. Um, and I would say that, simply put, this is the human condition. This is the condition that we all find ourselves in, trying to figure out what kind of world that we were born into and trying to make sense of our experience. Uh, this is life. You know, it's humanum. Um, and our most consequential decisions in life have little or nothing to do with science. And that is true for everyone, including scientists. Okay? So um, for all of us, I think the real question is, is there an ultimate source of meaning and value in the universe? And if so, what is it? So I'm arguing here for a kind of epistemology, a way of knowing, a pursuit of wisdom and a pursuit of truth that can be informed by science and what we know scientifically about the world. I think, you know, my religious uh, commitments and beliefs, um, I think, are always informed by science, but they simply go beyond science. And I think that has to be true for, for all of us in, in this search for an ultimate source of meaning and value in the universe. So this kind of um, 
epistemology or way of believing or way of coming to believe, I think it's echoed in certain places in the Gospels. This is one of my um, favorite quotes from the book of John, sixth chapter. It's a really long chapter. And in this chapter, Jesus has done some very difficult teaching. Uh, and apparently the crowd was a bit turned off by it. And you can go read the sixth chapter if you want to find out what the teaching was. Uh, but what I was drawn to were these quotes. After this difficult teaching, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. So he lost some followers. It cost him some stuff. And Jesus said to the twelve, do you also wish to go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Um, And then Peter goes on to say, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So there are a couple of things here that really resonate with me. One is to whom would we go? You know, do we go to science? I don't think answers are going to lie there. Do we go to Nietzsche? Do we go to, you know, I don't know. Who are we going to go to? I personally, in 65 years of searching, have not uh, found an alternate source of um, this kind of meta story about meaning and existence and where human fulfillment really lies that's more attractive or more interesting than the story of Jesus. Um, So I resonate with Peter on that uh, point, but I also resonate with this last thing. And we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now look, look look at that carefully. What comes first? Belief comes first, and then knowledge comes second. It's, it's the kind of belief, the kind of commitment you have to have in order to get married or start some kind of long-term relationship. And then you come to know it or not know it um, as time unfolds. So this resonates a lot with me. And, um, and I say that, you know, when I, when I talk about religious belief, I have a, a thing that I tell people, I think that religious belief is about one-third cognitive assent to some propositions about the world but only one-third, and about one-third, it's um, deep intuition, and about one-third, it's pure, undulterated hope. So I think that religious belief is kind of, you know, peculiar like this, and it has that mixture of currents in it, but I think, um, I think it's really important, at least for my life. So to summarize these two parts of the talk, and I promise you we're going to go to the brain now, I don't see any deep conflict between my religious faith and the actual findings of science. The tensions can occur between religion and the working assumptions of everyday science, but only when the working assumptions are elevated to a status of being the only reliable truth to uh, the only reliable path to truth, which I think just doesn't work for anyone, including people who profess that. Uh, when you scratch, it, it always goes deeper than that. Okay, so what about the brain? This guy's a neuroscientist up here, and he hasn't said a word about the brain, which is supposedly what he knows about. So I'm going to start with what I'll call the central dogma of neuroscience. Those of you who are biologists will realize this is a little bit of a play on words with uh, Francis Crick's central dogma of molecular biology, which was, you know, DNA leads to uh, proteins, leads to RNA, leads to proteins. And here's what I consider to be a central dogma of neuroscience. And I don't mean this in, you know, a negative sense. It's just, you know, a a set of working assumptions that powers research in laboratories all around the world. And the central dogma is all of our behavior and all of our mental life, including our sense of a conscious, continuing self, is inextricably linked to the biology of the brain. So... um, Everything about us, uh, the more we learn about neuroscience, and I could give you example after example after example after example, uh, from the tiniest sort of ticks uh, to um, the most um, profoundly felt emotions are linked in some inextricable way to the biology of the brain. And um, notice I'm choosing my words carefully here. I'm saying it's linked to the biology of the brain. I'm not saying it's determined by the biology of the brain. There's some words I'm avoiding using here that many neuroscientists would probably substitute in there. But I share with neuroscientists this conviction and this sort of methodological drive that's linked in deep and uh, interesting ways to the biology of the brain. Now, if that's true, the, some questions arise. Um, and one of the questions that I'll talk about here for the next, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes or so, is a question that's not usually asked by professional neuroscientists. Uh, you, it kind of gets conditioned out of you. Uh, but it'll be asked by undergraduates in undergraduate classroom quite readily, and it's what about free will? 
Okay? So where do we go with here? How do we start understanding freedom of choice and responsibility for choices in this kind of neurobiological world? And, you know, my quick flip answer to this is to quote someone. I don't remember who said this. I, it's not me. Uh, I got it. I lifted it off some Internet site somewhere. But the quote is, I am not a fatalist, but even if I were, what could I do about it? <laughs> um, so a deeper answer um, has to search for kind of ways that uh, humanity and modern thought has sort of approach this issue. And one approach to this issue is just to say all behavior is determined from bottom-up forces. We tell ourselves narratives about our goals and about our values and our beliefs and why we behave the way we did, why we choose the way we did. And in reality, the only thing that's causing any kind of behavior here is deep grinding of the neurochemical gears uh, deep in our brains. And that's where real explanatory power lies and this narrative uh, that we have choice and we're free and we chose chicken because of beef, because of this, this, and this, it's all fluff on top of the real causal gears. So that's what I will call bottom-up determinism. I don't find that very appealing, and I don't find it compelling in any sense. There, there are different holes in that, that story and that account of behavior that we can talk about later if you want to. Another one that has been appealed to is a source of uh, indeterminacy in the brain that leaves room for, in some sense, uh, more free choices is talking about quantum mechanics and the fact that our world at the deepest physical level is not deterministic. We know that. It is, it is probabilistic at the quantum mechanical level. Um, at large masses, quantum mechanics reduces to classical Newtonian mechanics, as we all know. But there are ways in which quantum mechanics breaks through into our macroscopic world. And one of the most powerful examples is absorption of photons. So an absorption of photon by matter is the quintessential quantum mechanical event. It's probabilistic. It's not predictable firmly in any given situation. It's merely probabilistic. And within that overall probability, uh, whether it gets absorbed on any one pass or not is purely a flip of the weighted dice. Um, and absorption of photons in your skin cells, especially high energy rays from the sun, uh, leads to melanoma. And if you develop melanoma and die, everything about our macroscopic world changes. Everything about your family's world changes, everything about your, your, your uh, workplace changes, uh, and there's a quantum mechanical phenomenon breaking into our macroscopic world, and it's not predictable, it's not term deterministic. And that is true, I believe that. And there are other examples you could cite, but um, Fundamentally, I don't think that quantum mechanics is going to help us understand brain function in a deep and powerful way that leads us to a greater sense of free will. So I'm crossing that one off the list as well. Um, there are people who do believe that, people like John Polkinghorne, you know, much better physicist than anything I would ever could ever have the potential to become. Roger Penrose, who some of you have probably read, believes this. I've never found these arguments compelling, but most importantly, I've gone to biophysicist friends of mine, I mean really high-level biophysicists, and asked whether quantum mechanics uh, plays any role, in, likely role, in neurotransmission, the synaptic transmission, you know, the opening of ion channels that allow currents to flow through cells, which ultimately depolarize cells and cause action potentials. And these people are very thoughtful, and they have uniformly said no. And the reason they say no is that the molecules that control ion channel flow are themselves so large, their mass is so large that they're too large for quantum mechanical events to play any significant role in their behavior. And I sort of take them at their word for that. I don't know biophysics well enough to know that, but I don't, I don't, my suspicion is that quantum mechanics doesn't help us here. Now here's another way that I think the average person on the street thinks about freedom, and many people in this room think about freedom, and I'd say almost everybody in this room at one point or the other thinks about freedom uh, because the intuition is so difficult to resist. And that is saying that freedom is defined. If a choice is, is free, that means that it's uncaused. Okay? Now, this is intuitively powerful. So the notion is that if, if a choice that I make has causes, then I'm not really free. I couldn't have made any other choice because of the causes, and that violates my basic sense of freedom, what it means to make a free choice. But I don't buy this argument, and I'll try to, I'll try to present to you an alternative way of thinking about this that is not worked out 
anything like perfection. It's not even necessarily original with me. Many of you have probably read other, other people who say similar things. I certainly have. But what I think is that when we talk about freedom uh, and freedom of choice, we're fundamentally talking about self-determination or autonomy. Uh, so I think choices that we make that are coerced are not free choices. So if somebody puts a gun to my head or someone I love and says, you do as I instruct or else, um, I'll make a choice, but it's not likely to be a free choice. It's a coerced choice. Many of us make choices that are coerced by the cultures that we live in. I pay my taxes. If I don't, I go to jail if I get caught. Um, and those taxes are frequently used for things that I don't want them used for and that I morally object to and I think are fundamentally wrong as a Christian. You know, nuclear weapons being one of the most outstanding ones. I just assume my tax money not go to that. And yet it has to because it's part of this culture that I live in, that I'm a part of. Um, and, you know, those, those choices are not free. Uh, I grew up in the south of the United States in the 1960s during under Jim Crow, my little town. We had black school systems and white. We had black restrooms and white. I grew up with that just as a background assumption, a background prejudice. Um, and I made choices based on that. And it's taken a lot of years to grow out of a lot of that. Um, but choices like that are not really free because they're not examined and they're not evaluated. They're just inhaled with the culture that we grow up in. Um, so there are a lot of choices that we make are not free. And I think what we really want when we talk about freedom of choice is we want some element of self-determination, of autonomy, and of awareness of the causes of our actions and being able to change those causes if we become convinced that they're wrong. So here's a better definition. I'm, I'm just trying to put into plain English what I mean by this. I, and, and the core intuition behind this is that my behavior is caused, at least in part, by my beliefs, my values, my memories, my goals, my aspirations. And these beliefs, values, goals, aspirations are not simply narrative froth that we put down on top of the course of events, but they actually play a causal role in generating my behavior. Now, notice that I say at least in part. I do not think that all of our behavior is shaped by our conscious beliefs, values, memories, goals, and aspirations. And we can argue about the percentage. Uh, I had a child psychiatrist one time I was um, in interacting with, and you know, I made a statement about one of my children and said, you know, he's never going to be the life of the party, but here's something. And, and the psychiatrist just stopped me right there. He said, I don't, I don't ever want you using the word never uh, about one of your children in my presence. He said, um, he said, we can argue about how much of behavior is determined and how much we have the freedom to shape in this office and in a therapeutic process. I might even give you that 85% is determined. But when we're in this office, we only talk about 15% that we can do something about. And I think that was a very true statement. It was a very, a very profound statement. So I, I use this phrase here at least in part, uh, knowledgely, uh, you know, that that there are much of our behavior that we don't have control over. A second corollary here is that conscious, rational thought plays a causal role in my behavior. And so many people argue that consciousness is kind of um, epiphenomenal, but I think consciousness is causal. And one of the best examples is this issue of cultural prejudice that many of us operate under. So if somebody shows me data that I've been systematically for 30 years grading students' papers differently uh, based on their gender or based on their ethnicity or based on their regional English accent, whatever it is, and somebody puts data in front of me, there's that, that prejudice has plays, played a causal role in my behavior, and I cannot change it unless I'm aware of it. I have to become conscious of it in order to even have a chance to change. Now, just because I become aware of it, it doesn't mean that I'm going to change, right? That becomes then a value judgment and a value proposition. But we have to become conscious in order to change certain things. And so I think consciousness in that sense plays a causal role in behavior. And I think the key issue here in neuroscientific analysis of behavior is what counts as a cause. So um, uh, in... And what, what I'm going to argue here is that neuroscience explanation of behavior is intrinsically multi-level and that you cannot throw away any kind of explanation from one level uh, by, without doing harm to the phenomenon itself. And I'm going to give you a concrete example of this from, uh, from contemporary neuroscience. 
And you'll see that I'm going to come back to this question about what counts as a cause. So, you know, some people who have a very fundamentalist interpretation of physics will say there's only four kinds of causes in the world. There's gravitation, there's electric, electric, electromagnetism, there's strong nuclear forces, and there's weak nuclear forces. That's it. Forces are what do work, and those are the four, and everything else is just an elaboration of those. And they'll, they, these are, you know, sort of physics fundamentalist uh, ideas about causation. Uh, but I have, I think, in, in complex systems, we have to have different ideas of causation. So here we go. This is my example. So we neuroscientists frequently, or almost always, start with behavior, some kind of behavior, interesting behavior that animals or people exhibit that we want to explain. I'm going to take an example here of long-term memory. Uh, and long-term memory is how you solve this problem up here, finding your car in a parking lot like this. Now, I frequently can't even remember which parking lot I parked the car in, uh, much less find my car in a place like this. And if we didn't have these little clickers, you know, that you could go around and look for your horn blaring and taillights flashing, I'd be sunk. Uh, but many people navigate, and animals navigate these situations quite readily. So spatial memory becomes what philosophers would call an explanandum. It's the thing that we want to explain. So we don't just sail into a laboratory and say, I'm going to solve the problem of spatial memory today. We have to operationalize that. We have to say, well, what kind of controlled behavioral condition that I can measure uh, in what kind of subject? How am I going to actually concretize this spatial memory thing? And for many labs around the country, we study mice navigating some sort of maze. It can be a physical maze like this, or it can be a water maze. Uh, it's very famous in the history of neuroscience. So we actually train these animals and get reproducible behavior and then try to find out what are the neural mechanisms in the brain that allow animals to learn and remember and practice these uh, sort of maze tasks. And one of the things that's come out of the history of neuroscience is that a structure in the middle of the brain called the hippocampus is actually really critically involved in solving these maze tasks. If you inactivate the hippocampus, you will, um, you will lose the ability to perform this task. Uh, and if you put the mouse in a different environment and teach it to solve a different um, uh, maze, you'll actually change the activity in the hippocampus. So this goes back in forth two ways. You change the maze, you're going to change the map in the hippocampus. If you change the hippocampus, you're going to change the animal's ability to navigate a maze. But you could say, well, how does that spatial map get established in the hippocampus? You're certainly not born with it because, you know, you didn't, you didn't have a map of that parking lot in your head when you were born. Uh, we learn these things. Well, how do, how do we learn those things? And one of the very significant discoveries in the history of neuroscience over the last 30 years or so has been the existence of what we call synaptic plasticity mechanisms. That means that these synapses, where information flows from one neuron to the next neuron, they don't just have a given strength that's there for the entirety of their existence. The strength of that connection can go up or it can go down depending upon the recent experience of electrical activity in that circuit. And this is a phenomenon called long-term potentiation, which actually increases the strength of synapses. And there's a phenomenon called long-term depression that decreases the, the, the strengths of these synapses. And these are constantly changing in your brain all the time, and they almost certainly underlie our ability to do long-term memory of any kind. So this is important, right, because it means that what we're doing this evening, if you remember anything tomorrow about anything that happened in this room this evening, it means we're physically changing your brain. You've got LTP and LTD going on in your brain right now, and you're going to walk out of here as physically a different person than you walked in here. Um, now, but you could say, well, how does long-term potentiation work? How is it that you increase those synaptic strengths or decrease them? And we know that there's a really interesting molecule in the postsynaptic membrane called the NMDA receptor. Um, and that in the NMDA receptor act activation is really critical for expression of long-term potentiation. But those NMDA receptors in the membrane, you can put more of them in the membrane or you can take some out, and that's under genetic control. So there are genes that actually control the, the uh, assembly of NMDA receptor molecules in the cell and the insertion of those things into, into, into the membrane. So if we talk about spatial memory, we've got at least, how many do I have up there? Six levels going here right? Um, and there are more below and more above. So you could 
go down from genes to chemical bonds, you can go from chemical bonds to atoms, you can go down to physics, and above you can go from spatial memory to groups of people who have spatial memory and manage to arrive in a room like this at four o'clock in the afternoon, all of us at the same time. That's amazing. Okay? <laughs> that is really amazing that that happens, that our brains are, are, are in this kind of coordinated activity. So there are levels above involving social interaction as well. But I would say that to understand spatial memory, it's these six levels that are really critical. If you go down below genes, to chemical bonds, and atoms, you learn more about the physical world, but I don't think you learn a lot more about spatial memory. Uh, if you go above, you can learn a lot about how social beings interact, but the phenomena of spatial memory itself, I'm not sure that you'll learn a whole lot more. But with these six levels, I think they're critical, and they're all critical. Now, there is a tendency in science, and every scientist tends to work at sort of one of these levels, and there's a tendency in science to think that my level is the privileged level. Uh, this is fundamental knowledge. And once I really understand things at the level of the hippocampus, I really know how navigation works, but the geneticists, I promise you, they've told me, no, you don't understand anything from just knowing about the hippocampus. You've really got to take this down to the level of genes. No truly significant experiment in the history of biology has been done without genetic concepts and genetic methodology. You know, and these, are, these people are serious, okay? And, the, and they, are, they, they believe their level is fundamental. And I argue that all of these levels are critical. Now, I'm coming back around to this question about what counts as a cause, okay, that I said is fundamental to understanding autonomy or self-determination. So just bear with me a little bit longer, and we'll circle right on around to that. But a critical thing is that all of these levels of explanation are necessary. This is laid out with far greater philosophical rigor than I can do by a philosopher, a neurophilosopher at Washington University in St. Louis named Carl Craver. He published this book called Explaining the Brain about 10 years ago, 2007, 2008, something like that. Uh, this is a really interesting book, and I've read it about four times. I learn something new every time I read it. It is not written for laypersons. It's written for his fellow philosophers. He considers himself a neurophilosopher. He actually did a master's degree in neuroscience, so he's been in the lab, and he gets his science right in this book. Um, I'm not qualified to say whether he gets all the philosophy right, but he really hones in on this, le- this, this notion of multi-level explanation. And here's, here's a quote from uh, Craver's book that I, I think really resonates with me as a scientist. So he says, um, he has this, this, this um, notion of mutual manipulability, and I'll tell you more about what that means in just a minute. But here's how he defines this concept of mutual manipulability. He's talking about parts and components. So talking about spatial memory, talking about hippocampus, LTP, NMDA receptors, genetic control of NMDA receptors, and understanding a biological mechanism, the integrity of a biological mechanism. And he says that one of the key things is this mutual manipulability concept. He says a part, one of these parts, is a component in a mechanism. If one can change the behavior of the mechanism as a whole by intervening to change the component, and if one can also change the behavior of the component by intervening to change the behavior of the mechanism as a whole. And he calls this making a difference. And I just love it that it's that simple, right? This is not dressed up in some kind of, you know, philosophy speak and equations that I can't understand. He appeals to something that I do understand as a scientist. Where in a system can I intervene and make a difference? And that's the way we identify mechanisms in biology. So what does that mean? It means that, for example, what I was saying about the mouse navigating a water maze, if we teach that mouse a new maze at a behavioral level, that map in the hippocampus is going to change. And you can actually have the camp- hippocampus switch from one map to the other, and you can have multiple maps built into the hippocampus. Uh, and if we change the hippocampus, if I go in and I manipulate the hippocampus, so I inject some, some anesthetized, a small amount of an anesthetizing drug and inactivate the hippocampus temporarily, that mouse will lose the ability to navigate the water maze. If I manipulate the hippocampus, I change the behavior. If I change the behavior, I change the hippocampus. That is making a difference, and that's exactly how we become convinced that that's a mechanism. And the same thing applies all the way down. If I change the spatial map in the hippocampus, I'm going to change which cells show LTP and LTD effects. If I create a knockout mouse that lacks the NMDA receptor, and therefore we eliminate the possibility of LTP, we are going to eliminate the possibility of change in the hippocampal map. And that manipulation at one level and seeing effects at the other level, 
That's in biology and probably all complex systems, that's how we become convinced that we're, that we're onto a mechanism. If that mutual manipulability between levels doesn't hold, we start to suspect we're not onto the mechanism anyway. If we hypothesize that long-term potentiation is a fundamental building block, a molecular cellular building block of the hippocampal spatial map, and we create a knockout mouse where certain genes are eliminated so that LTP is eliminated, and the animal goes on learning new maze is just fine, then we began to suspect that's not a mechanism at all. We were off on the wrong track with LTP, and we better find a different explanation. Now, this is really critical, this, which is why I'm sort of um, belaboring it a bit. Uh, it's really critical because it means that explanation is intrinsically multi-level, and this comes back to what counts as a cause. So I can see the thought bubbles over some of your heads here, and you're thinking to yourselves, what does all of this mean? I lost track of what is at stake here. I was kind of following him for a while, but I kind of got lost in, in a lot of that stuff here. And I'll just remind you that you know, what I suggested as a reasonable way to th talk about and think about freedom is that freedom is self-determination and it's autonomy. It's, it's, and, it's, and it's about our responsibility for the actions, our actions, and I said the key issue is what counts as a cause. And here's what we, I think, have to do. Using these kinds of hints and this kind of framework, I think we can find a way to talk meaningfully about non-fundamental causation. So you'll, got, you'll have physical fundamentalists who say all causation is down there at the level of physics. You'll have genetic fundamentalists who tell you that, you know, it's really about genetics in the end. You'll have, you know, physiological fundamentalists, and we should resist all of those kinds of fundamentalism. We need to be able to think about non-fundamental causes, and I think this understanding of biological mechanism as interacting levels gives us the framework that we need. And if we can talk meaningfully about multi-level causality and multi-level mechanisms in the brain, then we can take mental causation seriously and responsibility seriously, okay? Now, I want you to hear me on one important point here. I am not saying that bottom-up causes are unimportant. And I, what I'm saying is that explanatory relevance runs in both directions, both bottom-up from the tiniest atoms and genes and up to the physiological circuits, and explanatory relevance runs from the bottom down and because that's how we manipulate things and can make a difference in the system. So it's very simple like that. So let's just consider a couple of real kind of world examples of this uh, top-down language and bottom-up language. So here's some gene language. Go back to our friend Dawkins again from his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene. And here's a very memorable passage from that book. He says, genes swarm in huge colonies safe inside gigantic lumbering robots. That's you and me, by the way. Uh, the genes are sealed off from the outside world. They communicate with the outside world by tortuous, indirect routes manipulating it by remote control. They are in you and in me. They created us, body and mind, and their preservation is the ultimate rationale for our existence. Okay? It's bottom-up language. Now, Dawkins has a colleague, biologist at Oxford, who published his own book called The Music of Life about 20 years later. His name is Dennis Noble. And in, you know, a, a, a deliberate paraphrase of Dawkins, he looks at the same data and he phrases it this way. Genes are trapped in huge colonies. They're locked inside highly intelligent beings, molded by the outside world, communicating with it by complex processes through which blindly, as if by magic, function emerges. They are in you and me. We are the system that allows their code to be read, and their preservation is totally dependent on the joy that we experience in reproducing ourselves. We are the ultimate rationale for their existence. So these are two famous biologists at Oxford looking at the same data, but talking about it in very different language, okay? And I'm going to argue that truth doesn't lie solely on one side or the other. The, both the bottom-up and the top-down are relevant, have causal relevance. Here's a second real-world example that I'll give you. Some of you know about the Lasker Awards. These are basically American Nobel equivalent prizes for biomedical science. About five or six of them are given out each year. And this article in the New York Times caught my eye in 2006 because uh, a psychiatrist, this uh, avuncular looking gentleman, bow tie and all from the uh, University of Pennsylvania, was one of the five chosen to win the Lasker Award in 2006. How many of you know who Aaron Beck was? Is anyone here? I, I see a few hands. No, Aaron Beck. This is the character who invented the system of cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. 
And CBT is the most widely accepted form of therapy now in terms of being, you know, effective at generating behavioral change in a reasonably short amount of time. Most insurance companies, for example, in the United States will reimburse this where they will not reimburse certain other kinds of therapy. More importantly, the scientific literature has shown convincingly, as in this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine from 2000, that in treating serious depression, that using uh, the serotonergic uh, reuptake inhibitor drugs and using cognitive behavioral therapy in combination are more effective at treating depression than using either one alone. Okay, so the drugs are effective on average across people uh, as compared to controls who have no treatment at all. And the cognitive behavioral therapy by itself is effective on average uh, compared to people who have no treatment. But the two of them together are more powerful than either one alone. Now the drugs are a classic bottom-up intervention, right? They don't care about your work situation. They don't care about your family situation. Those drugs just get in your blood. They go out and hit their receptors. They bind with their receptors. They change neural activity in certain circuits. And on average, people get better. Not everyone, but on average, people get better with this. Uh, Cognitive behavioral therapy, on the other hand, doesn't care beans about those neurotransmitters and doesn't care beans about those cellular systems. It aims at a behavioral uh, intervention. It is a classic top-down intervention. In fact, um, the, the bottom-up intervention in, involves these neurotransmitters and receptors, but the top-down intervention actually aims to change patients' beliefs or patterns of interaction, and Beck himself called CBT a method for achieving cognitive restructuring. And I think this tells us a lot about ourselves as people, as human beings. What kind of animals are we? And the answer is we're both. We are susceptible to these genetic influences, and these can be that we, doctors, medicine can take advantage of that to help us in times of need, but we are also top-down people. And when you talk about cognitive restructuring, you're really talking about changing patients' beliefs about the world and their, and their patterns of interactions with the world. And, you know, the message from that is that beliefs matter. And I think that these beliefs, this is, this is the thing that's in, at the essence of autonomy, which I think is the key to thinking properly about freedom. And remember, I said my behavior is caused at least in part by my beliefs, values, memories, goals, and aspirations. And if beliefs matter, if they're powerful and they're part of the causal story of our behavior, then I think that's the key to unlocking this notion of freedom. And I'll sort of close by saying that um, I really do think that understanding the nature of human freedom is the most, at least one of the most, consequential problems facing the neurobehavioral sciences. Um, I, my father died of Alzheimer's disease at a, at a relatively early age. I know that I have one of the gene mutations that put me at risk for Alzheimer's disease. So I might say that solving Alzheimer's disease maybe is the most important <laughs> thing <laughs> facing neurobehavioral science. I certainly would like to see some progress on that before too many years go by. But I think understanding the nature of human freedom affects the very way we conceive of ourselves and the very way we conceive of our societies, the way we conceive of personal uh, responsibility and identity. So I think this is important for obvious reasons of human dignity and social responsibility, but here's a move I'm going to make that I think this is critical for science itself. So every time a scientist walks into a laboratory, you know, we do experiments having, having the belief that we can reason our way to truth about the world. And through the scientific method, through conducting experiments and fact-checking them against other experiments and building experimental results into a theoretical whole, we can arrive at something like truth. And that's objective truth. I mean, scientists really believe this, despite you know, some, of, some parts of our culture that would argue to the contrary. Um, but understanding this nature of freedom, our ability to make choices on rational grounds, uh, is really critical for science. And that, this is sort of uh, illustrated by my favorite quote from J.B.S. Haldane, who was a f- famous geneticist from the middle of the 20th century. And this is the quote. He says, If my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of the atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. And hence, I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. Um, so, you know, it's this logical circle, this circular kind of thing that you get into. Um, uh, and how much can you believe the results of science itself if you have no choice but to do the science and b- believe the things that you believe? Um, so I would say that, 
this understanding that I'm trying to promote here, and, and I, you should realize I'm very countercultural within neuroscience. Uh, most neuroscientists out there would probably disagree vehemently with at least some of what I'm saying. Some, some agree quite a bit, surprisingly. I gave this talk to a bunch of neuroscientists at Stanford and also philosophers, and there were psychiatrists in the room as well, uh, back in January, a year ago. And, you know, I did it with some trepidation, but it was surprisingly thoughtfully received. And so this, this sort of understanding of mechanism, of levels, the fact that all levels are important, and therefore our highest levels, our beliefs, our values, our aspirations, control part of our behavior, and that that, I think, is the essence of freedom. Um, this understanding of neuroscience, it doesn't prove anything religiously, okay? But I would say that this understanding is open to a holistic and profoundly religious view of the human person and our quest for meaning in this world. And with that, I will... Thank you for your attention and uh, we have some